Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's webcast. I'm Tim Wright, editor of Contract Pharma, and your host for today's session, which is going to be a panel discussion on the future of pharma manufacturing, uh, specifically about multi-product facility and equipment design. Um, we've seen recently that CDMOs need flexibility in facility design and equipment to support multiple kinds of uh, classes of products. Um, over the next 30 to 40 minutes, uh, we're going to learn about the benefits of multi-product facilities and the equipment and technology within, um, how to choose customizable cutting-edge technology from the right equipment vendors, um, why flexible people, technology, and equipment are essential to keeping up with every change consumer and regulatory demands, and ultimately what's next for facility and equipment design and pharma manufacturing. Uh, this webinar today is being sponsored by Grand River Aseptic Manufacturing. And uh, before we get into the panel discussion, I'd like to introduce Steve Knoll from Grand River to say a few words about himself and the company. Welcome, Steve. Thank you, Tim. Appreciate the opportunity uh, to present Grand River Aseptic Manufacturing. And thanks a lot to uh, Les Edwards and Andre. Uh, from Dan and Bosch and Strobel, uh, helping us here. Um, a little bit about Grand River Aseptic Manufacturing. So we're a contract development and manufacturing organization. We provide high quality sterile parental manufacturing uh, for clinical trials all the way through commercialization. Uh, we've grown uh, astrono astronomically over the past uh, 18 years or so, or I'm sorry, eight years or so. Uh, since our inception in 2010, we've grown uh, to 200 plus team members uh, with more to come as we prepare for continued growth and future capacity. Uh, most recently, um, Graham is, uh, has expanded our footprint. So we currently have more than 100,000 square feet of uh, manufacturing, packaging and labeling space in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, most recently, we designed a 60,000 square foot state-of-the-art advanced aseptic manufacturing facility uh, we broke ground on that facility in October of 2018, and we just completed media fills um, this past summer in 2020. So it was a very fast-paced uh, uh, build, and uh, as well as facility readiness and uh, qualification. Um, so in addition to that, uh, recently we uh, have been selected by the U.S. government, uh, BARDA, to expand the domestic fill finish capability for the COVID-19 vaccine. And we uh, also partnered with Janssen Pharmaceuticals to specifically manufacture their uh, COVID vaccine candidate. So that's a little bit about Graham. Um, I'm the vice president of operations. I've been with Graham for over five years and I have just over 22 years in the industry, all in sterile manufacturing and tech transfer. Okay, great. Thanks, Steve. Um, and as uh, Steve mentioned, we've also got two of Grand River's equipment partners that are going to join the panel. Uh, we've got Les Edwards from SCAN and Andre Dunzik from Baus and Strobel. So, uh, welcome, Les and Andre. Les, if you Thanks want to so maybe give a few words about yourself and your company. Absolutely. Uh, as I said, my name is Les Edwards. I'm the Vice President of Technology and Business Development for SCAN US. Uh, I've been with SCAN for a little over 10 years now and um, been in the industry for about 25, uh, developing a lot of the isolator systems and uh, aseptic filling technologies to uh, bring them kind of into the new era, along with our, uh, our leading uh, technology and containment as well. Great. Thanks, Les. And Andre, a couple words about you and your company? Yes. Hello and good morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be part of this webinar. So my name is Andre Dunzik. I'm part of an international team at Bausch & Strubel, responsible for business development, sales, project, and life cycle management of our pharmaceutical manufacturing equipment. So we specialize in aseptic container handling for vials, syringes, cartridges, and uh, ampules, um, something I've been doing with the company for 17 years now. And it's a pleasure being part of this journey with Graham that we started with a small filler uh, back in 2013. So looking forward to this. All right, great. Thanks, Andre. And uh, just to let the audience know before we get into the discussion, we will be accepting questions throughout the talk. You can type those into the box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will get to those at the end of the panel in a brief Q&A. 
Um, and this session is going to be archived on our site, contractpharma.com, for one year. Uh, if you're having any kind of technical difficulties, you can type those into the box as well, and someone on the back end here will help you out. So, all right, all the housekeeping's done. Let's get into other discussion here and uh, throw this one out to uh, you, Steve, and you can answer first and then just kind of have you guys kind of jump in and join in as you wish. So um, we've seen that as the uh, highly regulated pharma industry continues to evolve, uh, especially in regards to product containment and segregation. Uh, Steve, what have you seen? Um, what are some of the latest manufacturing trends and expectations? from a CDMO perspective? Sure, yeah, from a CMO perspective, uh, you know, it's very difficult to predict what customers might bring to you uh, into your facility. Every customer has a little bit of a different process. Every product is very different from one another. Uh, so for us, it's really just being flexibility, um, having the flexibility and then being able to cast a wide net um, to offer many different types of processes. Um, that uh, would allow us, the Graham, uh, to be able to manufacture different types of products for multiple different customers. Um, we have to maintain some level of flexibility, but in addition to that, we also have to have very robust and validated processes uh, for each, each customer um, and each process, and it has to be very repeatable. So it's kind of a fine line, um, but for us really is just having those offerings to customers and being able to provide them um, as many different potential options uh, based on their product compatibility and uh, their their process design um, to give them that flexibility. Okay, great. And Wes, how about you? What, from your perspective, what would you see uh, some of the latest manufacturing trends and expectations? Well, I would say uh, classically 10, 15 years ago, uh, we were very focused on large-scale vaccines, huge batches. Uh, we wanted to fill uh, products at very high speed and have very high throughput of a single product. Uh, today, uh, flexibility is the key. We need to be able to, to turn the cycle, um, very fast cycle times to turn the equipment over and get it into the next product line. So we have smaller batches, a lot more batches, uh, a lot more variability in different products. Uh, we also have a lot of new products that are more biologics, uh, a lot more containment challenges, uh, a lot more chemotherapeutics. So there's uh, there's a tremendous number of challenges that have come in the last 10 years. Okay, great. And how about you, Andre? What do you have to say about some of the latest manufacturing trends and expectations? Yeah, from uh, our point of view, it's also the flexibility uh, and the run speeds that have changed a little bit with these requirements. So we don't want to compromise the quality of the aseptic process, but we've had to make some changes. And one of the biggest uh, drivers has been the uh, ready-to-use container packaging. Um, with the standardization of the tub formats, we've really come to the point where uh, we can create systems that are container flexible. So we can use much more standard uh, systems and um, bring those to industry. We started with small robotic uh, equipment. Now we're doing a lot in clinical and medium-sized flexible lines, but also moving towards high-speed uh, flexible lines. Um, just a short example, one of our newest customers purchased a flexible clinical line and two flexible higher-speed uh, filling lines for vials and syringes. And so they're creating the whole facility around that, and they have the option to switch between vials and syringes or two machines with vials, two machines with syringes. So they're starting to take advantage uh, of some of this flexibility in that way. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, all right, Les, I'm going to throw this one out to you uh, first. And uh, so the expectation of more containment and segmentation when it comes to uh, product classifications uh, counteracts the economies of scale of multi-product facilities. Um, what have you done to design facilities and equipment to counter this trend? Well, the, um, the equipment is one part of it, uh, and the facility is, is, is another. And then even deeper into it, you kind of have the um, single-use systems that are available right now. So if I had to kind of categorize everything, we have kind of the primary containment of the process, which would be where the single-use systems are used. You have the secondary containment of the process where isolators are now becoming 
much more um, of a of the industry standard, not just for aseptic purposes, but also for containment of potent compounds and hazardous compounds. And then we look at the facility as a uh, as a tertiary level of uh, containment, where there you're trying to prevent any uh, contamination from even occurring in the first place. So the challenges here are um, are widespread uh, in in all three areas, and we try to build and design our equipment to be uh, well suited to to accommodate disposables on one hand and also make make facility integration very simple. One great example is um, we've innovated with a uh, new catalytic converter system. So now instead of having to vent our isolator to the outside uh, to the roof, we can actually vent it back to this surrounding room by breaking down the hydrogen peroxide with a super efficient nanotechnology-based catalyst. That allows a very simple facility integration and uh, and helps the overall process design. Okay, great. great. Uh, Steve, uh, how, from Graham's perspective as a CDMO, what was the, uh, what, what was it like working with us and the focus scan when it came to, uh, you know, the overall facility design and your expectations? Yeah, so from an equipment perspective, you know, uh, Graham made a huge investment in uh, purchasing, you know, a high-speed fill line from Bosch & Strobel with a scan isolator um, that actually has that catalytic converter that Les was describing. Um, and, you know, from a flexibility perspective, the Bosch & Strobel uh, filler that we purchased has a tremendous amount of flexibility uh, to allow us to, to work with either disposable systems or dedicated stainless steel systems, different types of pump assemblies. Um, but from a facilities perspective, what we've done to adjust is uh, really just having the data. Um, so we've identified, you know, our worst case compound, and we have uh, during various steps of the process, we've pulled data during dispensing, formulation, and sterile filling, and we established our controls based on that data. Um, so we've performed a multi-product facility risk assessment that identifies all the gates for potential uh, cross-contamination and making sure that we have procedural or engineering controls in place to mitigate any of those risks. Um, and then on top of that, Les kind of hit on the, uh, the single-use disposables. So having a validated platform process for single-use disposables um, at a wide scale. So all the way from a small scale uh, single use all the way to large scale commercial single use processes. Okay, great. And how about you, Andre, from Bausch and Strobel's perspective? Um, what's been, what was your experience with this expectation of, you know, uh, economies of scale of multi product facilities? And what have you done to help with the design of these types of facilities? Yeah, so from our perspective, of course, we're very focused on the equipment itself, but we've expanded our portfolio to give people uh, a lot more choices, different types of choices. And one of the ways we've done that is to actually partner with companies so we can learn from their experiences and from their knowledge. So we partnered with SCAN specifically for a new product as well as uh, with GEA is a freeze dryer company to create these flexible platforms. And the big development, the big change is really that the, the, the modular design of these systems. So in the extreme case, uh, customers can really choose to switch out uh, complete modules uh, to prevent uh, or to address the segregation. So if it's a different uh, container or a different process or just for the uh, opportunity to, to you know, mitigate any risks, you have the opportunity now to move that through modules and uh, something we continue to work on um, we've also created on these on our filling lines multi fill system um, system. So you you have not just one fill system to choose from, but you have the flexibility to change from one type of filling so solution to another, um, depending on what the process requires. Okay, great, thanks. Um, all right, I'm going to move the discussion along here. Talk about uh, regulatory issues. So maybe Andre, you would have liked to address uh, what you've done from the equipment provider perspective to meet regulatory agency expectations. I think here it's also worth mentioning 
that our clientele has changed a bit more. We're working with a lot more startups and people that are maybe new to the aseptic process. And they rely much more on industry guidance uh, rather than their personal experiences. Um, so we see a lot of activity in the early stages of drug and device development. And um, device development teams approach us to work with them early on on clinical trials, but specifically to find the right mix of containment components uh, and the fill assembly. So we do a lot in advising clients about what type of containers uh, to look for. And we keep in close contact with the glass and plastic component suppliers to partner and collaborate with them on the actual design uh, of the materials. So from our point of view, it's really the upfront work that we see being more involved with in order to, to meet expectations um, and to assist clients in also understanding um, through our standard processes. So we develop a few standard processes based on our experience that people can now pick and choose from rather than having to themselves have an in-depth knowledge of the, uh, of the regulations. Okay. And uh, Steve, from Graham's perspective, what's been the, uh, your experience with this facility build-outs from a regulatory perspective? Yeah, for, I mean, for us, really, it is just having the data um, and having robust procedures to evaluate um, and select the appropriate PPE um, and engineering controls to make sure that we have uh, the right controls in place to ensure the regulatory agencies as well as our customers that we can effectively manage a multi-product facility from an EH, EHNS and cross-contamination con perspective. Um, we've also, I also mentioned the facility risk assessment. I mean, really just having the data and putting it down on paper um, to be able to give the customers and the regulatory agencies the confidence that you have the correct processes and procedures in place uh, to make sure that there is no potential for cross-contamination. Okay. And uh, Les, from SCAN's perspective, what, how have regulatory agency expectations impacted your role in this partnership? Well, um, I would say, you know, 25 years ago, if you ordered a piece of equipment, that vendor built uh, the design that you guys requested, and then that got handed over to a team of engineers and scientists at the uh, major pharmaceutical company usually, and then they turned it into their own process. Today, uh, the customers are much more varied, again, small customers to large customers, and they're looking for a full solution. Um, so they're, they're not just looking for a machine that will do something for them. They're looking for a solution that will make product for them. So we got intimately involved in, in the problem discussions. And, uh, you know, Steve and I have had a number of phone calls about uh, just benchmarking various things about environmental monitoring, different regulations, different containment strategies. And that is expected now of, um, uh, of vendors to be able to be deep enough with the customer process to understand uh, what you're doing and why you're doing it. And uh, as far as the actual packages uh, that we provide, we also need to provide not just equipment that will work as a system, but also a compliance system that will be, we have to provide all the data, all the paperwork, and we have to provide all that validation uh, service to our customers directly instead of relying on third parties to do that for us. Okay, great. And, and Wes, um, how does equipment and technology allow for CDMOs to successfully manufacture multiple products uh, while still meeting these evolving regulatory demands? Uh, what's sort of been some of the latest developments? Well, one of the things that uh, Andre had mentioned was, was some of the modular technology, and that really has enabled uh, CDMOs to uh, focus on developing a process and um, customizing a process, but within a certain footprint. Uh, the various this, uh, development that was co-developed with, with Bausch and & Strobel and SCAN and GEA and other partners brought together uh, a standard isolator platform and also a physical system where you could put any process in this, I'll call it box or this platform, we call it an L-flange. And with that, you have um, uh, a, an open sketchbook 
where you can develop your own process and we can use it from anything from upstream and downstream processes in cell and gene therapy to very sophisticated uh, bio and syringe and ampule filling. Uh, so it can look like a lot of different things when it's finally done, but it really starts off as a very simple, uh, elegant module that can be customized. Okay. And uh, Andre, from a house and trouble perspective, you mentioned some technologies earlier, but what, how is the equipment technology evolving for CDMOs in this, you know, to, to manufacture multiple products? Yeah, I think some of the things are very traditional still, so cleaning, decontamination, that's uh, paramount for an aseptic filling line. And as Les mentioned, uh, we sort of lean on scan a bit for the science of that, but we work closely with them together. And we actually have specific groups that continuously work together. Um, and I think it's what, one of the things is a lot of our knowledge and know-how actually comes still from the project work. So we, we talk about standardization, we talk about the uh, vendor's responsibility in all of this to create a system which matches the regulatory expectations. But the customer is still an integral part, especially when we talk about, you know, reaching new standards and, um, you know, kind of entering into an adventure together sometimes on prototyping. And uh, the devil is still in the detail. And I, I would say we still learn a lot of, of what we do and, and benchmark things that we learn together during a project. Um, one of the things one of our PhDs is currently working on that, that's of interest is an automated wash in place procedure. So that's something we work closely with SCAN on. And uh, as a lot of this work, it, it sort of starts with these modules that we're developing together, but then they tra this translates to other type, to type of equipment as well. Um, shouldn't forget the disposable product path here. That's uh, kind of, a for I don't wanna say forgotten, but for us, it's everyday business. It took a lot of work to get here but having a, a liquid pathway that you can simply remove and start fresh with uh, is, is something that we're implementing on almost all of our equipment these days. So a really helpful tool that's already in place. Okay, great. And Steve, anything to add about um, you know, using this new equipment technology to manufacture multiple products and new facility types like grants? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, Les and Andre both kind of hit on it. Um, you know, just having a, a OEM a equipment manufacturer that has a lot of the offerings um, and the background knowledge, benchmarking, especially for a company like Graham. I mean, we are a small company, um, and you know, this actually is our first isolator. Uh, for previously, we had a traditional type filler with the RABS, um, so there was still a lot of learning that we had to do and uh, just how to work best practices inside the isolators. Uh, we, we did have a lot of conversations with Les and uh, you know, um, we established a lot of our processes based on obviously the regulatory requirements, but also what other people are doing in the industry as well. Um, and then too, uh, talking about the, you know, just the, the flexibility of the lines. I mean, the fill lines have come a long way. I've seen a lot of very flexible fill lines, um, but they're, they're sometimes not very repeatable and robust. Whereas the, um, as you know, the equipment has evolved over the years, uh, just the robustness and repeatability for setting up changeover, um, they've come a long way with that. And you know, Bosch and Strobel and Scan have been instrumental in helping get Graham to where we are right now in, in our new facility. So it's been, a, it's been a great partnership. Okay, great. Um, this is going to be the last question, last panel question before we move into the Q&A portion. Um, so anybody in the audience, if you do have a question, remember you can type those in at any time. Um, so uh, Steve, what do you think the future looks like, especially as it relates to product containment and segregation as the industry moves forward? Uh, I think really just the ability for CMOs and equipment vendors to continue to offer uh, even more engineering controls as the expectation of product contamination and segregation increases. Um, you know, modular equipment like the Variosys, uh, which actually Graham has just uh, put in an order for, um, as well as, a, as an additional fill line. Um, but the, the, modul the modular um, equipment for the Variosys uh, gives us a lot of flexibility um, and it gives us ability to segregate without having uh, to have completely separate fill lines. So, you know, the modular system allows 
a customer to have, uh, Wes was talking a little bit about the L flange. So as an example, I could have one isolator that has multiple different L flanges um, and these L flanges can be dedicated to different products or different processes. So that's kind of where the, I think the industry is going is, is offering that flexibility, especially for CMOs where you don't have to have eight or 10 different fill lines and you can offer customers multiple multiple options. All right, okay. And how about you, Andre? Any uh, last words on the future of uh, product containment and segmentation? Segregation, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think Steve has hit on it. We kind of gone through that. Um, but when I think about the, the future um, at Bausch & Ströbel, it's, it's really setting up our support infrastructures for this whole process. Because once the equipment is designed and the, it, that's the first part, but after delivery, uh, really the real work continues. And uh, so we've expanded our R&D team uh, dramatically. We have three clean rooms and we're there to support uh, Steve and his infrastructure with, um, with testing facilities. So uh, Graham took advantage of that to design a, a fluid path set up for a specific product. Um, and I think that's something we will continue to do as the, the equipment grows with their needs. Um, but also, as Steve mentioned, the monitoring systems uh, using artificial intelligence to help us predict the outcome of, uh, of the process, but also about the equipment. So key for Steve is going to be equipment uptime. So we want to be able to have predictive maintenance schedules and uh, the future for us is going to be a digital uh, technology to monitor the, the process, particularly with IPC uh, checks and, and, and collecting that data, sorting that data and using it properly for every aspect of, of the equipment um, that Steve relies on. Okay. And how about you, Les, and uh, Scan's perspective on the future of product containment and segregation? Well, two things. First, I'll, I'll uh, play off of what Andre was, was just talking about. Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier about working more closely with a customer to develop the process and working together. But uh, what Andre was talking about with, with service uh, is tremendously important. So as these systems become a platform, uh, they're no longer a static uh, unit operation anymore. There's something that can evolve so we can work more closely with our customers uh, to not only uh, develop new processes and upgrade these, this equipment, but keep it uh, high uptime running. We're using a lot of virtual tools with augmented reality and uh, lots of uh, development in our service organization. We went from in the last 10 years from six to 60 people located here in the United States directly supporting our, uh, our customers and we will continue to grow at that, that same pace because we're going to have more and more uh, challenges with um, more varied products, more cell and gene therapy, some smaller batches and high flexibility requirements. And um, so uh, all along the same lines of what we've been talking about, you know, the, the CMOs of the, of the future are going to be modeled after Graham. Uh, with a lot of flexibility, a strong infrastructure of good processes, but also a lot of flexibility to, to develop and customize solutions for their clients. Okay, that's going to bring the uh, panel discussion side of the set to an end. Uh, before we move into the q and I did want to mention uh, that there is a PDF available for you to download there on your screen, so uh, go ahead and do so when you can. Um, and if you do have a question for our panel, now's the time to uh, type that into the box at the bottom of your screen. Um, all right, let's get into the questions here, guys. First up, this audience member would like to know, can Graham do clinical packaging post-filling, including binding label? Yeah, so after uh, filling and inspection, Graham does offer packaging and labeling. Uh, as well as full serialization and aggregation. Um, we've done clinical as well as, uh, most of it has been commercial, but we do offer clinical uh, packaging and labeling, and we also have done some kitting. Um, and I don't know about the blinding aspect, so if it is a blinded, uh, every process is a little bit different, so we certainly need to evaluate that process. Um, if there's an IVRS-type distribution required, we would need to 
uh, do that with a with another third party because we do not do IVRS distribution for clinical studies. If uh, hopefully that's clear, but but yes, we do do packaging and labeling of clinical and commercial, um, and we have done open label and blinded studies. Okay, great. Uh, let's see here. This uh, this audience member asks. Are there any trends towards a greater use of filling lines per year through the use of new technologies to gain even two more weeks a year of fill time given the short campaign of most product requirements? Yeah, I'll, I'll grab that one. Okay. Um, so one of the most uh, important technologies that we've been utilizing in a lot of the uh, isolated filling lines is uh, our, our scan fog gassing technology, which allows you to get quick turnaround time. Also, with the various modular type systems, you could switch from one um, uh, closure or container closure profile um, to another. So you can switch easily and quickly from a vial system to a syringe system, for example. So um, as far as actually saving you uptime throughout the, the entire year, when you look at it from you know a maintenance perspective, uh, obviously, we want to maximize your uptime, but I think what really we can answer cleanly is you can do a lot more batches per year in the same amount of production time because you have very short cycle times and very quick turnover. Um, so you can get two additional weeks of um, two additional weeks worth of production time because you have less downtime in uh, changeover process for sure. Um, whether you you still have to do your compliance fills, your media fills every six months and the like. So um, you're, there's a certain amount of downtime required for maintenance that is still going to be required, uh, but we want to do. Uh, and Andre, if you want to add something about, you know, predictive maintenance and some of the other work we're doing on that, that would be great. Yeah, sure. So um, we're doing a lot more work on uh, monitoring um, the system itself, so not just the process, but also how the equipment is performing and to try to prevent these long stretches of uh, shutdowns um, and just to stay on top of things. So in the future and already being realized now is we can monitor the temperature of a motor per se and other parts of the equipment to get a better uh, understanding of how long that, that motor will last or if there's something that we need to actively you know, get involved with. Um, as artificial intelligence and our understanding of that also, uh, you know, grows, that, that should just improve it. But basically just monitoring, sorting the data, and then, you know, using it in a way that's, that's helpful is a, is a big aspect of our future, um, you know, goals for the equipment, but also just making sure that the equipment is well maintained. So we offer service level agreements for predictive maintenance. And if you stay on top of your greasing and, and, and just some, have a good understanding of the equipment, you can make a big impact by, uh, you know, reducing downtime of the equipment that you, that you can predict. Okay, great. Thanks, Sanjay. Um, next question asks, does the advising that you provide extend to regulatory requirements as well as product presentation, container closure selection? So if, uh, from a grant perspective, we, we do support uh, some regulatory submission. Uh, so if a customer you know, does a submission, we would support the CMC section in providing some of that information. But as far as uh, you know, the regulatory um, you know, piece, we, we would not support that completely. We rely on the customer or uh, another um, you know, another person to do that uh, outside the organization. Um, and then the other, what was the other uh, second part of the question? Oh, as far as the container closure integrity, um, we typically rely on the customer to give us that presentation based on, you know, uh, the fill volume that they're looking for and the dosing instructions. We do have uh, certain container closure um, that we keep in stock and on hand, uh, which sometimes might help expedite your process, you know, through the tech transfer piece. If you choose a, uh, a vial stopper and seal that we already have on hand and we have qualified with our equipment. The other thing to consider is that um, stoppers, depending on the coating and the design of them, 
they do track differently throughout the, each fill machine is a little bit different. Um, and we've done all of our testing with, you know, certain stopper configurations. So if you can choose a stopper uh, that we have already qualified, that would help expedite your process to go from the tech transfer to the uh, manufacturing more quickly. And then I do, um, I do know that Bosch and Strobel uh, does provide um, some type of consultation uh, as far as like fill volume studies and stuff like that. Bosch and Strobel has helped us out with that. Uh, with our existing fill lines. I don't know if Andre, you, you want to add to that? Yeah, typically, I mean, we try and be fast for CMOs, especially because you try to get your clients on the line as quickly as, as necessary. But the sooner you approach uh, Graham and then Bausch and Ströbel, you, we can actually take the containers in, the combinations of containers. We can test everything in our facility and put them together, send them out to a lab, or back to, to you and, and the client in the end to make sure that container integrity uh, fits properly together. Um, we're also working really close with the, with the suppliers of the components. So we actually have a piece of equipment with some of the uh, containment solution suppliers that they do a lot of this testing ahead of time. So just like C Steve said, he has an inventory. Um, also, they have an inventory where they can, you know, through the three of us, Graham, Bausch and Strobel, and the supplier, the supplier can also advise you what they've tested successfully already and what already works well. Okay. Um, this question is kind of a, it's a long one, but kind of I think involves all three of you. So uh, get a little response from each of you for this one probably. Um, how did the plan design build process go for Graham? Uh, did you take an agile approach or did you plan everything in painstaking detail and then change plans and specs ad hoc? What level of involvement did suppliers, including Dawson, Strobel, and Skin, and others have in the planning, design, and build process? And maybe Steve, you want to start with that? Yeah, so we design, we did a uh, design-build approach, um, which, you know, has its own challenges. Um, so, you know, it did change. So, you know, our initial design, we had probably, you know, 30 or 40 different iterations of the, of the building design, the clean room design, the clean room flows. Um, and so it, it was a, it was very painstaking, you know, details, but um, as, as the project evolved, we had to make some changes and pivot a little bit. Um, and then as far as the, the suppliers go, so we had to make sure that we purchased because of the lead times, right? So the lead times on equipment, um, you know, they, they are long lead times and, and often longer than the building uh, process. So we already purchased our equipment before we built the building. So we had to design some of that around the equipment um, and making sure that, you know, the, uh, the clean rooms, the ballroom designs would support the equipment uh, and also allow us to get tanks in and out. So we kind of had to design around that because um, to do the design build and then the aggressive uh, timelines that we were on, uh, we had to order the equipment well in advance of, of breaking ground and even doing uh, first, uh, you know, design of the uh, clean room and the facility. So, Okay, great. Andre, Wes, did you guys want to add anything? Yeah, I just brought back some memories, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while, but I, I remember there were a lot of different ideas at the beginning, even the location and what floor of a, of a building the equipment might be on, um, the different layouts that, that we talked about. So we did a lot. I think we did a lot of layouts at the beginning and, and talking about different speeds and, and the options. I think less from your point of view, maybe the isolator system was going to be mounted on the side for, for a little while. But um, I mean, the, the team really ended up doing a great job because I don't think we had any major changes once we once we started the project. So taking the time uh, ahead of time to organize yourselves and as Steve mentioned, to buy the equipment early enough to allow for a good design around a piece of equipment, uh, I think is was, was the right strategy. Um, Les, I don't know if you have some things too. Yeah, yeah I'll just I'll, I'll, I'll throw out there that, uh, well, first of all, I was in uh, at Grand River with, you know, in snow and wearing short sleeve shirts in the summertime <laughs> too. But we had a, had a number of visits there, got to, got to experience all the weather in Michigan. But the um, best part about it was really, it, it was collaborative the whole, the whole way. 
and we always were focused on the process. So um, the facility was not a, a second thought, but it was centered around the process. So we had, uh, by virtue of being, you know, partnered with uh, with Grand River and Bass and Strobel, we knew what the core of the facility was going to look like, and we could uh, give our advice and um, uh, counsel along the way uh, related to that. And it was okay if the facility changed because there was no, there were certain things that still couldn't change no matter what. So. Uh, okay. Great. All right. Thanks, guys. Uh, let's see here. This uh, audience member would like to know how important becomes automated visual inspection versus manual visual inspection in the future of pharma manufacturing. Yeah, so, you know, obviously, um, when we first started um, at Grand River, you know, we were a growing company. We only had audit or, uh, manual visual inspection. Um, but as our customers have grown and our batch sizes have grown, and the throughput in the facility, um, you have to have some level of either automated or semi-automated, you know, inspection. I think just to keep up with the throughput. Um, at Graham, we've uh, we've evolved from you know having 100% uh, manual. We also have some semi-automated uh, visual inspection, and then we just recently. Um, because of the throughput that we have to get through the new facility with new fill lines and everything, um, we have purchased some 100% automated uh, inspection machines. But, you know, as a company, you have to, you know, evaluate that individually based on your product portfolio as well as uh, the volume of products um, going through because it might not make sense to have a, a semi -autom or 100% automated visual inspection system on, you know, a product batch that maybe you're only doing 30,000 units for because you have to validate every product individually. And that's a lot of work for a hundred percent automated visual inspection system. But uh, for, from Graham's perspective, we absolutely have to have semi-automated and automated just to keep up with the uh, production throughput. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, let's see here. Moving on. As far as changeover using the L flange, how has the shop floor operators embraced that? Are there any, have there been any struggles? Uh, so, you know, we haven't, we haven't received any uh, burial cysts yet. So I can't really comment on that, but I, I don't know what Les and Andre have seen out uh, with their customers. Yeah. One of the biggest things that we, we find is just making sure you're planning for it. Uh, I would say, but 50% of the customers that have the l systems are buying it for future capability to be able to change out. But a lot of them aren't changing them all that rapidly. Um, we expect that in a CMO type of operation that they're going to be wanting to change it out uh, more frequently. And they're going to have, they're going to build a portfolio of l flanges for different uh, processes, whether they be aseptic filling or maybe, maybe a, a formulation or cell and gene therapy process of some sort uh, that fits in the same L flange. So you want to have clean storage for those. Uh, the actual movement of the L flange and, and pushing it in place, uh, Bachelor Strobel has a great video of it showing, um, don't mean this to sound Texas, but 110 pound soaking wet uh, girl pushing it, no problem. I mean, it's not that hard to, uh, to put it in place. And you, know, you press the button, inflate the seal, and uh, and then you run your cycles. And with the new uh, new versions of Variasys now, you can do those cycles in under an hour, so you're up and running very quickly. The machine adjustments and setup is very simple. Uh, and maybe Andre, you can comment on that too. Yeah, no, that classic video is the one I was going to mention too. <laughs> I mean, uh, Scan and Bausch and have been doing this actively together since uh, 2013. So we've we've had a lot of these, and it's more been oh just um uh educating people it looks like okay you can still see me good i'm just having a notice yeah, here that you. i have an issue all right nice cool so it was originally it was more educating people you know because it was a new idea a new system you're removing something from the aseptic process and you're reinstalling it um but we've gone through many iterations with many different customers i think we're up to 30 customers at this point using the system and each one of them had you know their concerns, but we've worked through all of those. And if you wanted now to have a fully automated uh, uh, 
facility, we even have a solution where they can automatically run around your facility and install themselves. That's maybe a little bit next uh, next level for the future, but it's in the works. But generally speaking, I, I think the handling aspect has been addressed, and uh, people are, people are pretty happy with it. Okay, great. Um, let's see here. Are there any process or machining developments to labeling biologics in cold environment instead of RT environment that you've seen recently or upcoming? And we've always, you know, for uh, you know, cold chain materials, um, especially with the COVID uh, processes, there, there's a lot of minus 20, and minus 80 storage requirements, um, and just not having a lot of data uh, for room temperature that does come up. Um, but uh, we aren't doing anything as far as uh, labeling in a cold environment. Uh, it has been brought up, but really what we're trying to do is, is get, get data, stability data on the product uh, so that we have some time out of refrigeration. Um, and then obviously it also requires a lot of uh, procedural controls to make sure that you're tracking the time out of refrigeration to make sure you don't exceed uh, certain uh, you know, times at room temperature. Um, but I, it has been discussed. I don't know if other uh, if other CMOs or other pharma companies are doing that, like inside a, a cold environment. Um, but we we haven't see, I haven't seen that. Others may have. Okay, great. Um, let's see what's next. Do you see a shift in the balance between manufacturing and packaging operations from a CDMO perspective? I guess that's coming from. Um, you know, from, from our perspective, we, we usually see uh, both. So a customer wants to come in, obviously, if they have something, you know, filled into a, a vial stopper and seal, uh, they're going to need a package, right? So, um, you know, they like to have that one-stop shop so they don't have to, you know, ship it off-site and, and have to another CMO or a packaging facility. So we try to offer um, that level of flexibility as well. Um, so Graham does have packaging and labeling capabilities, uh, you know, as well as full serialization, aggregation, and then a couple different packaging configurations that we can pack into um, using a couple different cartoning options. Okay, great. Uh, let's see here. We got a few more here. Um, all right, this is a long one. Uh, can you share the, the latest regulatory requirements and inspector challenges regarding product contact material compatibilities, uh, referencing absorption, no product impact from use of polymers, et cetera? Um, and part of that is do you see an industry effort among suppliers and ISPE to provide customers and regulatory agencies with reference documents to help establish approved materials? Um, let's throw that out there. Yeah, um, so we use we use a lot of uh, single-use um, disposable materials uh, at Grand River. I know, um, you know, Andre uh, from Boston Strobel, they, they've helped us design some of those um, single-use systems. But all of the, uh, the big players in, in that area, they seem to have a lot of, you know, data on, um, on, their buff on different buffer solutions. So, you know, example would be, you know, some aseptiquics or, um, the Mobius bags that we use for our Mobius systems, they, those suppliers have data on, you know, different buffers, um, different solutions. Um, but it's really, it is, you can leverage some of that, but it's really up to the customer to get, you know, product compatibility data and do product compatibility studies um, in addition to all that. Um, okay. All right, great. Thanks. Yeah. And I, I personally haven't seen any ISP baseline guides on any of this stuff yet, but I'm sure people are probably working on it because that's a they're great questions, and this is something that's definitely working there. So unfortunately, it's not my area of expertise. I can't can't spend you know uh, can't say a lot a lot about that. But I, I know we talk about other uh, background concentrations of peroxide and things like that. We do a lot of uh, compatibility test there for bioprocesses for cell and gene therapy type applications and um, those things we get get heavily involved in more process modeling and uh, and compatibility testing but those are one-off type of uh, uh, customer requirements or re requests versus 
uh, doing things through uh, ISP or PDA or any of those groups. Okay. Uh, I, I would just add that, yeah, we work a lot with Les and SCAN's team to make sure that the materials on our standard equipment meet, you know, a wide range of applications, but can also, you know, get into specific materials. Um, and I think the positive thing is, is that you have a, a, a much bigger range of uh, options these days. It's, it's, it's not the newest thing to use some of these materials these days. But um, yeah, it's something each individual customer and product need, need to look at. All right, thanks guys. Uh, let's see here. Um, are the isolators and filling systems connectable to ISO PI based arc for data acquisition and predictive analysis? You wanna kick us off with, uh, <laughs> with automation, bless her. I can, I can I could say yes, yeah. we definitely do it, right? Yeah, so as far as um, uh, the the isolators are for sure um, tied into upper level systems, whether they be, you know, our the SCADA systems are already at, at our level, but some people have higher level SCADA systems, uh, data historians, uh, building management systems we're tying into, whatever. Um, some people want to tie their um, environmental monitoring systems into uh, other data acquisition systems because they take that as far as in their annual reporting and want to digest and um, utilize all the different statistical data on on particle counts and the like uh, in uh, in that. As far as um, specific links to Pi, there are a couple of our clients who use Pi um, and. The interface is basically the same. We have kind of an open data table type architecture that you can pull uh, that data as as you wish and uh, and do with the, what the data. Uh, you can pull it every second, every five minutes, or whatever you want. Um, and that's it's been important to our customers that we have that that open architecture that's retrievable. So. Okay. Thanks, guys. All right, got time for a few more here for each of you. Um, Steve, this one here is for you from a grant perspective. Uh, you had the ability to design a facility from the ground up. What edge did that give you regarding facility design and multi-product production? Yeah, well, that it, it really, uh, um, you know, we had a, a basically a blank slate, so we didn't have hardly any constraints, you know, in the process when you're building a facility, a greenfield facility. Um, so it really allowed us to consider, you know, have a wish list put together, right? And one thing we wanted to do is, because we are a CMO, we do have a lot of visitors uh, from customers and auditors. Um, it gave us an opportunity to really kind of, uh, you know, provide a customer experience, if you will. So when they come into the new facility, um, there's actually dedicated uh, customer uh, offices so that they can actually have a dedicated office when they're on site. Um, and that those offices view directly into the formulation suites. Um, in a previous roles, I've, I've done tech transfer into other CMOs, and, you know, it is sometimes a challenge as a customer, um, especially when CMOs have different customers on site, of uh, keeping people separate and then also giving them the visibility they need. So we really tailored the new facility to that. We have a lot of uh, viewing corridors with windows directly into uh, formulation rooms, as well as the uh, the isolator grade C filling suite, which I think is a little unique. So customers can actually watch the filling happen from a non-classified area, but be viewing into the grade C clean space. Um, we also were able to uh, think about future expansion, right? So we, we uh, allowed about 14,000 square feet of future expansion space in this facility. And we designed it based on future equipment and equipment flows. So we were able to really uh, think about the, the equipment flows for new uh, equipment when it comes into the facility during the installation phase, which could really shut down a facility when you think about, you know, with, when you're already in operation and you get new equipment in, you have to have that equipment flow through the facility. We were able to design the facility with that in mind so that we have minimal impact uh, to the existing operation as we get more uh, scan and Bosch and Strobel equipment in the future here. Um, you know, we were able to focus on employee 
uh, morale, right? So we were able to put a really nice break room that has a, a view of downtown Grand Rapids, um, just a nice space for, for employees, you know, to have their breaks um, and uh, conference rooms, as well as we thought about engineering. Um, you know, we were able to get a lot of people involved in this to get their wish list together because Graham is a small company. I don't, I think that'd be very challenging in a, in a bigger pharma company, but um, we were able to put a lot of uh, people's wish list together um, and design the facility around that. So like for engineering, as an example, most of our air handlers, if not all of them, I believe are inside the facility. So they're not up, up on a roof or outside working in, you know, on these things in the winter time. And I know from a facilities and engineering perspective, you know, they definitely appreciate that. So all those things went into that and, and made that a, a great process. All right, great. Thanks, Steve. Um, uh, I think I was actually set to come and visit the facility before this uh, whole corona thing yeah. happened. So maybe when it's over, I'll have to get out there and come check it out. Absolutely. Um, You're welcome. All right. Uh, let's see, Les, here we got one last one for you. Two parts here. What level of containment or biosafety level can isolators provide? And how long does it typically take to turn around from one batch to the next? Can, can you run about one, more than one batch a day? Um, so I'll begin with the end there. Yes, you absolutely can run more than one batch a day. Um, the, the newest isolator systems have uh, like a one hour cycle time. So it's incredibly quick. Uh, if you're doing one batch to the next, it's very quick and easy. If you even need to change out the equipment or do a different setup, uh, a new setup of a new change part can be anywhere from five or 10 minutes to less than an hour, maybe a half hour is, is uh, at most typical. Uh, but there's always obviously a, a cleaning and, and uh, uh, clearance issue there. You have to turn it around. Um, but, you know, a, a couple hours max is really uh, all you need to turn around these, these lines. And you can do high potent compounds as well. We do a lot of biosafety level uh, three, two and three, two is very common. Uh, three can be done with our isolator systems uh, and also OEL up to band six uh, level compounds we've uh, we filled with our in, in our equipment. So uh, there's a, there's a lot more to that than just the box around it. Uh, it goes all into the process and uh, working with our our partners like Bausch and Strobel on the design of the equipment as well. Okay, cool. Uh, let's see, one last one here for you, Andre, and then I think we're going to wrap things up. Um, what sizes and types of containers can one process on a standard flex filler? And what filling system is best suited for multi-product facilities? Yeah, okay. So as a standard um, for vials, we can do pretty much 2 to 100 ml and everything in between. Uh, Graham chose the option to do a bulk uh, wash or tunnel as well as ready-to-use components. Um, but with ready-to-use components, I would suggest using a, a tub format. That's the, the most standardized system. Makes it uh, pretty easy to also then add a, a syringe component. Um, and for syringes, it's uh, up to 10 ml, so 0.5 to 10 ml. Uh, cartridges, I think the standard format that's available is a 3 ml uh, in a ready-to-use format. And um, But all of this, we, we still do individual processing. We have... Uh, leading into the filling systems. We have different filling systems available. Uh, peristaltic pump is probably the one that's most suitable, I think. Um, you can have the peristaltic pump also outside of the isolator. At this point, we use a single single hose system, so no Y connectors anymore. Um, but anything that connects well to you know, a disposable product path, I, I think is appropriate. Um, so you can have a rotary piston pump, uh, time pressure, probably not. Uh, we have a new filling system with ViscoTech. It's a partnership for really high viscous products. But I would I would recommend probably a peristaltic pump for most applications these days. And the only reason to put it inside of the isolator would be like uh, the what Les mentioned. If it's a high potent and there's a safety issue, you'd have it inside, or or you just want that you know extra comfort of having it inside. Um, but yeah, I think that pretty much pretty much covers it. I, I guess I would say work with us uh, ahead of time on your components to make sure that they're going to be compatible and the packaging is compatible. But if you stay in, in the standard tub configurations, um, 
you're, you're very safe. And again, with a system like what Steve has, uh, you, you have really a massive amount of options to use bulk files for specific for Lyo or cartridges that are, you know, ready to use. So really have a huge range of possibilities as a standard already. All right, great. Thanks, Andre. Um, yep, so we are at the hour. Uh, so we go ahead and uh, conclude today's webcast. Thanks again, Steve, Andre, and Les for uh, participating in the discussion. Um, you guys did a great job. Uh, thank you again to Grand River for sponsoring today's session. And uh, thank you mostly everybody in the audience for your uh, attendance and participation. We really appreciate it. Um, as I mentioned at the top of the hour, uh, this session will be archived on contractpharma.com for one year. You've got the PDF download that you want to make sure you get to. And um, thanks very much for joining us. Have a great rest of your day, everybody.